critical new phase for historic recycling reforms that advance California's move to a circular economy. Plus, community gardens turn food waste back into superfood for soil. What would otherwise go into a landfill, we're able to turn it into a beautiful soil that helps regenerate our lands and helps grow food for the community. The new grant awards headed to tribal communities. Cal Recycles monthly public meeting starts now. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Calorie Cycles March 2024 public meeting. This meeting is for Californians by Californians as we work together to protect our communities and fight against climate change. Before we begin, let's look around and identify the two exits closest to you. In the event of a fire alarm, we are required to evacuate. Please take your valuables and use the ceiling mounted exit signs. Do not use the elevators. If you cannot use stairs, you will be directed to a protective vestibule inside a stairwell. Should we have to relocate out of the building, remember to follow the traffic signals and exercise caution crossing the street. Now here's the information about our Spanish language interpretation. Language shouldn't be a barrier when it comes to protecting our air, water, and land. CalRecycle is simulcasting this meeting in both English and Spanish. Click the public meeting banner at the top of calrecycle.ca.gov or a link to our webcast in English and Spanish. If you're attending this meeting in person in Fire and Share Auditorium, we have Spanish interpretation devices available. Let our team on the left-hand side of the dais know if you need one. El idioma no debe de ser una barrera cuando se trata de proteger nuestro aire, nuestra agua y tierra. CalRecycle está transmitiendo simultáneamente esta junta pública en español e inglés. Puede encontrar el enlace en línea en español e inglés en la parte superior de nuestra página web calrecycle.ca.gov. Si asiste a esta junta en persona en el auditorio Byron Share, tenemos dispositivos de traducción al español disponibles. Solo informe a nuestro equipo al lado izquierdo del mostrador de presentación si necesita uno. Our first agenda item today is the director's report. CalRecycle Acting Director Crystal Acierto is here for her first CalRecycle monthly public meeting. Welcome, Crystal. Thanks, Maria. Good morning, everyone. Um, super happy to be here today and to be joining the CalRecycle team. I think this is a really exciting time at CalRecycle as we're moving forward um, on several of our packaging and beverage um, container recycling um, programs. And um, you probably all saw, but really excited to announce that we're moving forward with the formal uh, rulemaking process for both SB 54 and for SB 1013 on the dealer um, co-ops. And so our draft regulations are out there, really encourage folks to um, weigh in on those and take a look at those. I know um, we've been doing a lot of um, informal engagement over the last year on both of those, but really looking forward to continuing those um, conversations over the coming um, months. Also just want to highlight um, some grant award announcements today and for both uh, for SB 54, 1013 and grant awards. Um, I know Zoe will be um, talking uh, more about those, but just want to highlight um, some, some grant awards that are being announced today, including community composting um, awards that are headed to um, tribal communities. So really excited um, about that. Um, this latest grant application cycle was only open to tribal communities and we'll be sharing additional details on that. Um, shortly. So thanks again for um, having me for this first meeting. Really excited to see you all here today um, and to continue um, again the conversation and working with you all um, for whatever time that I'm in this role. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Maria. Thank you. March is a big month for California's historic recycling overhaul as we enter the formal rulemaking process and two significant reforms. Deputy Director of the Division of the Circular Economy, Zoe Heller, joins us now with updates. Good morning, Zoe. Good morning, Maria, and good morning, everybody. So as Crystal said, we're very excited to announce that SB 54, the Plastic Pollution Prevention and Packaging Producer Responsibility Act, permanent regulations were submitted to the Office of Administrative Law on February 27th and published in the California Regulatory Notice Register on March 8th. The 45-day comment period ends on April 23rd, when CalRecycle will host a hybrid public hearing for additional comment. The SB 54 Advisory Board met earlier this month, and they plan to meet again for two meetings in April. Sign up for the SB 54 listserv for um, implementation updates and all important dates coming up. So switching gears over to SB 1013, the um, 
SB 1013, California Beverage Container Recycling and Litter Reduction Act permanent regulations pertaining to dealer cooperatives and dealer registration were submitted to the Office of Administrative Law on March 4th and published to the California Regulatory Notice Register on March 15th. Starting January 1st, 2025, retailers in areas with no recycling centers will have the choice to either redeem in store or join a dealer cooperative as SB 1013 removes the option for retailers to pay $100 a day fee instead of redeeming. We really appreciate the feedback we've received during the past informal workshops for both SB 54 and 1013, and we've taken those comments into consideration for the regulations that um, you all have, are, are um, reading and hopefully commenting on now. You can submit your written comments on um, dealer registration and proposed dealer co-op regulations by April 30th, or join us for our public hearing on April 30th here at the Cali PA headquarters. Register online to participate remotely. And then moving on to AB 2440, our Responsible Battery Recycling Act. This law requires producers, either individually or through a stewardship organization, to safely collect and recycle loose batteries. We're hosting a public workshop on April 3rd at 10 a.m. here in Byron Share to gather feedback on draft regulatory concepts. Join us in person or register to join remotely and sign up for CalRecycle's Battery Stewardship Listserv to receive periodic updates about the program. Back to you, Maria. Next on the agenda, over half million dollars in community composting grant awards for tribal communities in California. But first, let's watch a quick video showing how the Community Composting for Green Spaces grant program helps cut climate pollution, strengthens local economies, and feeds people in need. Neighborhood by neighborhood, Californians are fighting climate change by recycling their food scraps at community gardens and small-scale composting sites like this one in San Diego. This was all onion peels and citrus peels and eggshells. What would otherwise go into a landfill, we're able to turn it into beautiful soil that helps regenerate our lands and helps grow food for the community. With $1.5 million in support from CalRecycle's Community Composting for Green Spaces grant program, previous recipients added 117 new neighborhood composting sites, planted nearly 500 trees to provide shade and grow food in underserved communities, and kept 5,500 tons of food and yard waste from creating methane in landfills, cutting climate pollution equal to taking nearly 600 cars off the road. So we're also actually healing our environment. Many more sites are expected in the coming years with $4.7 million in additional funding for neighborhood composters. I want to do the best as I can to retake those nutrients and put them back into the soil here. The benefits don't stop there. We can replenish the soil and we can build community around just like you see in this garden. When an individual is able to see their banana peel turn back into good quality compost that nourishes our soil, they see for themselves how it completes the cycle. They leave feeling really hopeful. As the next round of community composting grants roll out to more communities and tribes, California is building new infrastructure and modeling new pathways for the state's waste-free future. Anybody can compost, everybody should compost. It is easy, it is impactful, and it is a way that you as an individual can feel connected to being part of the solution. Deputy Director Zoe Heller has the grant award announcements. So today we're very excited to announce $510,000 for eight community composting projects on lands that are under the ownership, management, or stewardship of tribal communities in California. The minimum award for Grant Cycle 3 is $25,000, and the maximum award is $100,000 for a single applicant. These projects will increase the ability of tribal communities to operate small-scale composting operations. Next on the agenda is our Farm and Ranch Cleanup Grants. Nearly $84,200 in Farm and Ranch Cleanup Grant awards um, were given to Contra Costa County Resource Conservation District in Tulare County to clear a nut orchard and other sites. More information is linked on today's agenda. Since 1997, CalRecycle Farm and Ranch Cleanup Grants have helped more than 1,000 sites have illegally dumped tires, vehicles, construction debris, or other trash. As a reminder, we have several grant program applications due next month for the Farm and Ranch Cleanup, Waste Tire Cleanup, and Beverage Container Redemption Innovation Grant programs. 
We continue to accept applications for our greenhouse gas reduction loans and recycling market development zone loans year round. So moving on to carpet, I have um, a carpet stewardship program update. CalRecycle re received CARES revised contingency plan amendment and training guide on February 5th in response to the notice of disapproval signed by CalRecycle's director on December 5th, 2023. CalRecycle must approve, conditionally approve, or disapprove CARES revised contingency plan amendment by April 5th. The department's decision will be announced at the April public meeting but you can also sign up for the Carpet Stewardship Listserv for an update on the decision. Back to you, Maria. CalRecycle has upgraded its public comment intake system, making it easier to submit your comments. Here's how. California wants your input on recycling and trash pollution issues. Join CalRecycle's decision-making process by making a live public comment on any of today's monthly public meeting agenda items in person or by phone. Microphones are available for those of you in the room with in-person comments. If you're joining remotely, you can call in with your comment. Just click the public meeting banner at the top of our website, then click the public comments button for step-by-step -step caller instruction. We will address live public comments at the end of the meeting. A heads up about an upcoming workshop for a covered electronic waste recycling program. We want to hear your thoughts about possible changes to the covered electronic waste recovery and recycling payment rates. Every year, CalRecycle has the responsibility to consider and determine the recovery and recycling payment rates necessary to fund, on average, the covered electronic waste collection and recycling industry. Join us here in person or register to participate remotely on April 8th at 10 a.m. for staff analysis of net cost information and provide recommendations about payment rates. Moving on, CalRecycle is required to review and approve or disapprove each countywide integrated waste management plan five-year review report. The County of Santa Clara submitted a five-year review report concluding no revisions to the county's planning documents are necessary at this time. This item was approved. CalRecycle also approved two contracts as we work to keep more tires out of our landfills and our environment. You can find the proposed scope of work for the evaluation of the state of waste tire rubber devulcanization technologies contract linked to today's agenda. We have the green light to work with the University of Houston on this project with a contract amount limited to $425,000. On top of producing a report on the current state of waste tire recycling, the contract will explore, explore devulcanization of waste tire rubber techniques and refuse, or sorry, and reuse. <laughs> the research may help reduce dependence on virgin rubber and slash energy and carbon emissions associated with rubber production. The contract is anticipated to begin in May 2024 and end in June 2026. Then, uh, next item is uh, the second approved contract, and that's for the scope of work for the environmental impacts of the use of tire-derived aggregate in so civil engineering applications and rubberized asphalt concrete state of knowledge. The $98,500 contract with the Cal State Poly Technic University of Humboldt will assess the environmental impacts of using tire derived aggregate in civil engineering projects, as well as waste tire crumb rubber in rubberized asphalt concrete projects. Study findings will be included in two reports and will help find ways to minimize possible environmental impacts. The contract is anticipated to begin in May 2024 and again end in June 2026. Next on the agenda, Waste Permitting Compliance and Mitigation Director, Deputy Director Mark DeBee is here with an announcement. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Maria, thank you. Um, each spring, CalRecycle's tire program shifts unspent funds from the current fiscal year into grants or activities that were identified needing additional funding. This fiscal year, there is $3.2 million available for reallocation purposes. Five hundred and seventeen thousand nine hundred and seventy-three. I paused because I wanted to get it right. Um, will be directed to fund thirteen jurisdictions on the B list for the local government waste tire amnesty grant program. 
100,000 will be used to fund the waste tire hauler compliance manifest system to assist with implementing an electronic mobile manifest system that was approved through Senate Bill 1181. And $190,936 uh, will go into a contract for California Pavement Research Center for a rubberized technology in um, infield study. The remaining funds um, will be, um, will go back to the main tire fund. Um, I wanna continue on um, in the tire theme here and uh, also let everyone know that the five-year plan for waste tire recycling management program, the 12th edition, covering fiscal years 23-24 through 27-28 has been published on the department's website site and it can be assessed via the publications catalog. And moving on to solid waste as well as tires, um, we'll now see a video about solid waste and tire facility permits and emergency waivers. And there's gonna be a, an overview of California facility standards and then the update on where we're at with some of the permits. Protecting the health of Californians and their land, food, water, and air is a big job. Local, state, and federal agencies play different roles to enforce public health and environmental safety standards. In California, solid waste local enforcement agencies process applications, issue, and enforce permits for solid waste facilities. These include landfills, transfer stations, compost facilities, or similar operations. CalRecycle must verify permits are consistent with state requirements. Permits can only address areas within the authority of local enforcement agencies and CalRecycle. Check out the link below for more detailed information. Emergency waivers allow temporary changes to solid waste permit requirements in response to local or state disasters. Local enforcement agencies may approve the waivers, which are good for up to 120 days and may be extended. CalRecycle must review approved waivers and can condition, limit, suspend, or terminate them. Check out the link for more detailed information. For waste tire facilities, CalRecycle processes applications, issues, and enforces waste tire permits. These include requirements to make sure tires are stored and processed in a way that reduces potential threats from fire and disease-carrying vectors like mosquitoes. Check out the link for more detailed information. For San Bernardino County, the department agreed with the local enforcement agency and concurred on February 20th, 2024, a revised compostable materials handling facility permit for One Stop Landscape Supply E. Action was needed April 5th, 2024. New to this month's agenda, for Riverside County is El Sobrante Landfill. This is a modified solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed April 22nd, 2024. Preliminary review of the permit package indicates the following proposed changes. Updating the name of the operator and owner, correcting the existing maximum depth, updating the estimated closure year, and updating the following sections of the permit. The finding section, the documents that describe and or restrict the operation of the facility section, the self-monitoring section, and the local enforcement agency condition. For Los Angeles County, Southern California Disposal Company and Recycling Transfer Station. This is a modified solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed April 27th, 2024. Preliminary review of the permit package indicates the following proposed changes. Updating the address of the facility and updating the following sections of the permit. The findings section, the prohibition section, the documents that describe the operation of the facility section, the self-monitoring section, and the local enforcement agency condition. For the City of Los Angeles, 
CWS DTLA Material Recovery Facility and Transfer Station. This is a modified solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed April 27, 2024. Preliminary review of the permit package indicates the following proposed changes. Updates to the legal description of the facility section, finding section, documents that describe and or restrict the design and operation of the facility section, the self-monitoring section, and the local enforcement agency condition. You can find more information on any of today's agenda items. Just go to Cal Recycled's homepage and click on the public meeting web banner, the one at the top of the homepage if you're watching this live or halfway down the homepage at any other time for a link to the agenda and associated public notices. Now is the time for public comments. First, we'll take any comments that may be uh, happening from anyone present in the room and you can use the microphone up to my left, it doesn't look like we have any. And then we'll take the, um, after this, we'll take the calls coming in and make sure to mute your microphone if you're calling in. Good morning, Jeff Don Levy with Ming's Resource East Bay and Ming's Recycling here in Sacramento. Uh, Acting Director Acierto, welcome. Definitely a exciting time in the program. Uh, a lot of changes. Uh, what I'm not seeing though is any new recycling centers opening in Northern California or any indication that any co-ops are gonna form in Northern California. <clears throat> Currently, California has 6,141 redemption locations in California, but all we really hear about are the 1,250 recycling centers. There's 4,891 stores that are willing to take back an unlimited number of CRV containers. It's just very difficult to find on the website. One of the things I've been asking for, and hopefully we can do this pretty quick, is combine the recycling center list with the in-store take back list on the website so when somebody types in their zip code, all the redemption locations show up. Um, that way we can start promoting people going to the, the in-store locations, especially in the unserved areas like Northern California. I know it could be done pretty quick. Uh, it doesn't need legislation or regulation. So I'm asking for that support again. Yeah, the draft uh, co-op regs that came out last week, um, pretty extensive. I saw some of the comments from uh, the prior uh, informal process were accepted, which was great. But what I didn't see was uh, the department clearly defining a new comparable and sufficient standard as uh, identified in SB 1013, because the zones have quadrupled in size and staff is pointing back to 14571, I believe, that just says there needs to be a recycling center open for 30 hours. But that was when the zones were 0.7 square miles. Now the zones are 3.1 square miles. So I would ask the department to look again and expand what a new comparable and sufficient uh, and convenient redemption system looks like for the consumers and not just go back to the status quo because 1013 changed the rules and it looks like they asked staff to define a new comparable and sufficient because the same 30 hours was good for 0.1 or 0.7 square miles, uh, not for 3.1 square miles. So we've quadrupled in size. Um, within the program, you know, I've, I've gotten up here before saying we want compliance, and I think uh, the department all looks for compliance. We all know that if we short pay a consumer, that would be a big violation. Uh, nobody wants to do that. But what's happening on a daily basis is recycling centers are being short paid by the department because the per count system doesn't work. We've got a show and tell here. So we have the new wine and spirits that have come into the program. Several recycling centers have delivered those to our facility and 60% of them have been underpaid. So they're giving out quarters for these 
and they're getting back nickels and dimes. So they're being short paid every time they accept these from consumers. It's something that we can fix pretty quick. I got 50 PET bottles in here, water bottles. The engineers that produce these are fantastic and smart, and they're getting lighter and lighter. These 50 water bottles will get a consumer 50 nickels or $2.50. But this bag right here weighs 1.2 ounces. So that means the recycling center is eligible to get $1.60 back. So every time a consumer comes in by count, for these 50 containers, they're getting shorted 90 cents. There's no way to get that back. Department staff actually instructs recycling centers to violate weights and measure laws by splitting loads. We're not supposed to do that. Consumers are very smart with the per count, and they know they're getting lighter, and they know the per pound uh, segregated rate is not correct. So many consumers come in, they bring in 50, they walk off the property, they come back in with 50 more. Walk off the property, come back in, get 50 more. Cal Recycle says that's allowed. Um, weights and measures, I think, would look differently that that is splitting a load. There is a solution to this. It could be done administratively. It's a math formula within the Doris redemption system. I presented it to staff and I hope we could look at this pretty quick. Because where this really applies is you guys are advertising 40 million for the innovation grants for RVMs and bag drop systems. Those are per count programs. Per count programs will lose five to 10%, maybe 15% of their CRV because the per count to weight formula is incorrect. So anybody that's looking at starting a per count program with RVMs or bag drop, they need to realize they're walking into a five or 10, possibly 15% loss of CRV revenue. Las Vegas was built on the casinos making three to 5% of money wagered. And they built that entire city on just losing, or on, on the gamblers losing a small percentage. With this per count system, everybody that's applying for the innovation grants, there's a lot of carrots there, and I've described it, that the carrots are hanging over a trap because the per count system needs to be fixed, and it can be fixed administratively. It just takes some programming, so asking for help there. Otherwise, the grants that are gonna go out will probably hurt more people, and then, three, four, five years later, we'll be trying to figure out what happened to the program. When it was supposed to grow and get better, it might just get worse. I uh, talked about adding new, new material to the program. Um, that means more glass, more PET. I didn't see the commingle rates go up. That's something that needs to be done by law. To pay all the program participants their fair share of the CRV that's in their mixed material. So the curbside programs, collection programs, um, there's more glass that's CRV, there's more PET that's CRV. So the CRV rate should be changed, and I believe by statute they're required to be changed every April 1st. With that, I'm also asking the department to look at a commingled rate going into 2025. Uh, because we don't want to be overpaying for material, and then a lot of material will not be labeled when we get into 2025, which could be a problem for the recycling centers. Uh, I think that would require legislation because it was taken out, asking to put it back in. But with that, wine bottles, consumers are going to put a dime down as a deposit, and the average wine bottle is 1.8 to 2 pounds, so they're going to put down a dime and they're gonna get back 20 cents. Pretty good return if they do it on the per pound system. One of the things that I'm suggesting is we look at the Hawaii program where they have a small bottle rate and a large bottle rate. 
So we're not gonna overpay for the wine bottles or the, the liquor bottles that are in the program. Um, just like we don't want to underpay the consumers, we don't wanna overpay them either. So that would apply to the commingle rates as well. Uh, last thing, certification continues to be a concern as far as where sites are getting permitted. Uh, last week or two weeks ago, we all saw the announcement about the $140 million settlement with the facility here in Sacramento. Everybody asked me about it, and I'm like, it's kind of old news, but as soon as that site passed the five-year period, they were recertified as a processor, but worse, they were recertified as a recycling center 200 yards away from another recycling center who had done absolutely nothing wrong. Um, I do want more recycling centers in the right area. We don't need to put them right next to each other. Um, I'm getting word from some friends down in Southern California that a recycling center is being permitted or certified 10 feet away from an existing site that's been there for 10 years. And that person will lose their handling fees and the way that the zones have expanded and the overlapping zones, two other sites are gonna lose handling fees. Yes, we need more recycling centers, but we don't need them right next to each other. So I would hope Cal Recycle could use their discretion and their judgment uh, not to certify sites that are right next to each other that will cause financial harm to another site. So again, welcome to the new position. We look forward to helping any way possible. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, there was a lot there, so uh, we'll definitely be continuing to have conversations. I think we also have a meeting set up, so hopefully we'll be learning more from you on um, some of those concerns. And then I think on the 1013, just want to make sure um, that you submit comments that I know that you shared here um, through our formal process as well, so we can make sure that those are included and evaluated as we're looking at the regulation. But thanks for, thanks for your comments. Do we have another comment in the room? Good morning, Cal Recycle team. Good to, good to see you all. Uh, my name is Martin Arrow. I am the CEO and co-founder of Recycle Tech. Uh, we provide and aim to provide AI-powered bulk RVMs with integrated bag drop to RCs and dealers. Uh, additionally, we are currently operating a Cal Recycle pilot program in Cupertino and are pleased to announce we will be expanding into Sunnyvale on April 2nd. So. Very excited there. Uh, I'm here today because I'd like to share a few key takeaways that we've learned over the past three years deploying bulk REM systems. Uh, first are some findings that we've learned from our customers that we're servicing at the pilot location. Uh, number one, a lot of the customers that come up to utilize our system tell us that they really appreciate using account-based system because they're able to easily correlate the amount of containers they're recycling so the amount of money that they're earning, one small container equals five cents, one large container equals 10 cents, it's very simple for them to understand. In a weight-based program, it's a little bit more complex. Also, they also appreciate how a bulk RVM could handle hundreds of containers within a given minute, versus traditional RVMs are single feed and lead to a slower process to get their money back for CRV. On top of dealing with the customers, we've had experience talking to a lot of different redemption centers uh, all across the state of California. Uh, a few of the findings that we've learned there is that bulk RVM systems have the ability to help redemption centers reduce their labor costs. This could happen by implementing a self-checkout model. So if you're familiar with how Home Depot or some of the food stores have a self-checkout center, you could now have one employee as a gatekeeper uh, directing customers to multiple of these bulk RVM systems, uh, allowing them to process more customers. Additionally, they have the ability to comply with regulations and reduce fraud utilizing these systems. As the material flows through a bulk RVM system, they could use AI vision to understand what items are CRV and what items are not CRV which is something that's very beneficial to these different centers. However, there are some concerns that I would like to address today. First, 
Redemption centers are at risk of losing CRV payments because of the count to wait variance, which Jeff had brought up earlier. Uh, this is something that we would like to work with CalRecycle on addressing to making the system more sustainable, uh, more economically sustainable. Uh, one question that I would like to pose to CalRecycle is do we have a timeline for resolving these count to wait discrepancies in CRV payments? This is something that we could talk about after uh, the rest of the comments. Uh, another question or a point that I would like to make is that many redemption centers are currently concerned about introducing single feed RVMs with limited capacity in unserved zones, which would change the zone from unserved to served. But because it is a single feed system, it is limited to the amount of material that could be taken back inside of that zone. So a question I would like to pose to CalRecycle is, are we planning, uh, is there a plan on how to scale CRV buyback to meet the demands of a zone? Or are there a, a volume of containers that have to be accepted inside of the zone in order for that to be considered served? Uh, these are some of my comments and questions that I had today. Uh, Crystal, welcome. And I would just like to thank CalRecycle for the time of hearing our public comments. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for providing those comments. I appreciate it. Are there any more comments in the room? Okay, so now we will go to our online public comments. And again, uh, if you are calling in, your microphones will stay muted until you're called on by the last four digits of your phone number. Once you're called on, please mute your computer sound before you start speaking to avoid an echo. Lance, are you ready? Uh, yeah, we have uh, three callers. First caller with the last four digits, 9942. You can go ahead and unmute your microphone and provide your comment whenever you're ready. We'll give them a few seconds here and then I'll move on to the next person. Hello, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Hello, good morning and welcome to, uh, Director Asierto. My name is Nadia Ameri of Recycling Innovation, and I'd like to draw your attention to a proposed new recycling center that is planning to open 10 feet from our Recycling Innovation site at 8454 Reseda Boulevard. Our site has been open for 10 years, serving the community. In the Northridge and Van Nuys area, there are close to 70 recycling centers in the 90 square mile area. There are sufficient recycling centers for everyone to recycle. Los Angeles County and our area has a redemption rate of over 80%. If this new site opens, all the other recycling centers could be hurt financially, making all other sites less profitable. Recycling innovations will lose our handling fee payments, increasing our costs and possibly causing our site or other sites to close. We have worked tirelessly during this decade to perfect our recycling operation and do not deserve to be put at imminent risk of closure. The proposed new site will not increase convenience to consumers. It will harm the existing recycling centers, causing harm to the program. Section 14501F of the bottle bill states, the purpose of this division is to create and maintain a marketplace where it is profitable, profitable to establish sufficient recycling centers and locations to provide consumers with convenient recycling opportunities. For the department to approve and certify additional recycling centers, especially 10 feet away from an existing recycling center that has been operating for 10 years does not help the program, it hurts the program and makes other recyclers in the area less profitable. The department has the duty, authority, and responsibility to deny applications for new recycling centers in areas that already have sufficient recycling opportunities for consumers. I ask for your consideration, support, and compliance with the intent of the bill. Please find a solution to situations like this.
All right, thank you uh, for that. Um, any comment from the um, panel? Um, I actually just missed the caller's name, if I could get that again. But My name is Nadia Amiri of Recycling Innovation. Okay, Th thank you so much for your comment. Um, uh, thank you so much. And then uh, next, we're going to have a caller with the last four digits, 0392. I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute. And then when you're ready, you can um, state that who you're with and make your comment. Good morning, Cal Recycle team. My name is Susan Collins, and I'm the president of the Container Recycling Institute. Last month, I gave a comment to talk about the errors in the governor's budget in the section on the beverage container recycling fund, fund number 0133. The fund balance listed in the governor's budget is only $538 million for June 30th, 2023. However, the same fund balance is accurately reported in CalRecycle's report to the state controller's office as $830 million, which is a difference of nearly $300 million. And that was the financial report that was signed um, by the director and prepared by the accountants of CalRecycle. There are also many other errors line by line in the governor's budget reporting of the prior year financial statement. It's my understanding that a legislative budget committee will be voting on these numbers this week and that they are perhaps unaware of this $300 million error. The accurate reporting of the budget, both past year portion and forecasting is critical to the ongoing financial health of the beverage container program. My, I have two questions. The first is, what has CalRecycle done to inform the legislature of this error in the governor's budget? And the second question is, what has CalRecycle done to work with the Department of Finance to correct their reporting of the CalRecycle financial statement? And I'd like to also extend um, my congratulations and welcome to the acting director. Thank you very much. Thanks, Susan. Really appreciate it. Um, so I will just say in terms of kind of the governor's budget and what we internally are, are um, evaluating as far as, as far as the BCRF fund balance, um, kind of standard governor's budget process is to go through reconciliation with the Department of Finance through the fall. Um, as indicated in the governor's budget, we were not able to fully reconcile the fund balance um, with the Department of Finance, and so that was indicated publicly in the, in the governor's budget um, galley. Having said that, kind of through standard budget process, we're continuing to work with the Department of Finance on reconciling um, the fund and understand that what was put out publicly, again, was not fully reconciled. Um, and so we are working through that diligently with the Department of Finance. Um, and even based on kind of preliminary um, reconciliation, understand that there is um, a concern with some of the proposals that are out there for general fund solutions. So, um, as you likely know, there was $100 million that was included as a general fund loan last year from the fund. Um, that loan included language that essentially said that the loan would be repaid back immediately in the event that that loan could potentially impact program expenditures. And based off of our preliminary um, reconciliation with Department of Finance, we've determined that that could potentially have impacts to program expenditures. So we've already worked with Department of Finance to repay that $100 million loan. So that, that funding is already back into the balance of the fund. Um, over the next several weeks um, and, and months as we head into May revision, as I mentioned, we'll continue to work on reconcil reconciling the fund with Department of Finance. Um, that will include a reevaluation of the general fund loan included in the governor's budget, the $125 million. Um, at this point, it's too soon to tell whether um, for sure that's going to be pulled back. But again, preliminary indications um, uh, do suggest that that might potentially have programmatic um, uh, impacts, and in that event, we would not be moving forward with that. So again, too soon to say anything on that, um, and we'll be continuing to work through the department of, with the Department of Finance over the coming weeks and expect that we'll have a reevaluation done more formally as part of May revision. But really appreciate your comments. Um, obviously, this is a really important um, fund that supports a lot of really important um, activities, and so we'll continue to monitor that closely. Um, both internally as well as 
with the Department of Finance. And so all of this has been shared um, with the legislature. I know we've got a hearing tomorrow where we expect this may um, come up. And so we'll be sharing this information again with, um, with folks tomorrow um, through that process. But appreciate your interest in this. And hopefully that provides a little bit of clarity on where we're at. Thank you. And the final caller, last four digits, 6607. I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute, uh, and then you can state who you are, your affiliation, and proceed with your comment. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Go ahead. Hello? Great. Uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate the acting director, Ms. Arcieto. Uh, my name is Leonard Lang. Uh, I have been in the program since the beginning, something that Kip Lipper and I are about the only two who can say that. Uh, I, uh, in the past week, have received a number of calls about recyclers uh, going to lose their handling fees because somebody else was going to move into the uh, the zones. Uh, in the case where the lady spoke be before me, six recycling centers would go out of business and be replaced by one if that were permitted. Now, uh, as anybody at the department can say, I uh, believe in following the regulations. I think the issue here is in the uh, readiness plan that uh, this recycler is going to immediately open up and have six competitors uh, in close proximity. And then finally, uh, it's my understanding that the uh, recycler is not permitted by the city of Los Angeles. And once they go operational, they have uh, five days to send a, uh, an affidavit signed under penalty of perjury that they have all their permits. So I would hope the department would look to those issues. Uh, secondly, uh, <clears throat> the grant uh, programs, I'm getting a lot of calls about people wanting to get involved with the grants. Uh, it's my belief that the, uh, the grant uh, the grant granting system should be adopted in regulation. Does the department intend to adopt those grant regulations? Hi, Leonard, thank you for the question. Um, no, we do not intend to for the Redemption Innovation Grant. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not hear that response because the uh, the system was telling me that I muted while you were responding. So could we repeat that? Yes, and I'll take a beat before I respond. Okay. Um, no, we do not intend to develop regulations for the Redemption Innovation Grant Program. Okay, good to know. Uh, Another issue, and it was brought up earlier, uh, the uh, press release that went out on the recycling fraud for $140.5 million. Uh, I have some familiarity with that, uh, that situation. I've read the accusation. Uh, this was a processor in Sacramento that over its five years of existence was paid approximately $80 million to reimburse recyclers. So that money ends up with recyclers. So can you find out for me how they expect to collect 140 million from some people who were never even paid 140 million and certainly didn't make 140 million? Uh, I'd appreciate that. Uh, don't need a response right now. Uh, the regs do say, statute says that uh, the department has to be realistic and consider the ability to pay. So I would throw that in. Uh, last but not least, uh, Susan Collins brought up the issue of the, uh, the governor's budget. The governor's budget noted that loans were coming out of the uh, beverage container recycling program fund. And in the past, that has not worked out well for recyclers. Is there anything you can do to prevent those loans from hitting the fund, especially when the grants go out and we'll be depleting the fund. And I'll turn it back to you. 
Thanks, Leonard. As, as I mentioned, we are actively monitoring the balance of the fund and completely agree with you about the importance of these funds um, and make, making sure that we have a healthy balance. So as I mentioned, we've already uh, worked everybody. with Department of Finance. That loans were coming out of the uh, recycling program fund and in the past it has not worked out well oh. for recyclers. I I think that's just a delay. Otherwise, um, you have the magic of repeating um, exactly word for word, which I can't remember what I said 30 seconds ago. So um, so anyway, as I mentioned, uh, we're already uh, working with Department of Finance and we've already repaid the $100 million loan from last year and um, agree with you. The What I will just say again is that those loans include language in them that specifically prevents um, them from having pr programmatic impacts. We would be immediately Department of Finance would be on the hook for immediately repaying those loans um, in the event that they would have a programmatic impact. So we're monitoring that very um, closely and um, as I mentioned, is a top priority for, for me um, and for the department to make sure um, that we can avoid any impacts there. Of course, these loans go forward because um, the state's obviously got a, a larger issue with a general fund deficit and so we definitely want to be team players as part of the administration and so we have those conversations but as I mentioned it's a top priority for us to make sure um, that we're not moving forward with things that could um, have a negative impact on the program so appreciate your comments um, uh, that comment and your other comments Leonard thank you is that all the callers Lance that's it okay Thanks to everyone who participated today in our public meeting. And also you can find today videos from today and the recording of the public meeting on our YouTube page. We will get those videos uploaded as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful month and we will see you next month. Bye-bye.